All right, so today we're um, diving into ancient Greece, you know, think, uh, togas, temples, and some really big thinkers. And we're tackling a name I'm sure you've heard before, Socrates. But this isn't going to be like, you know, your typical boring history lecture. Oh, no, not at all. We're going way beyond just recognizing the name Socrates. Right. And like really trying to get to know, like, who was this guy? Yeah. And we're doing it all through these encyclopedia entries about him. It's so interesting, right? Because we always hear about Socrates as this like philosophical giant, almost like a myth. But like, how did he become this larger than life figure? What was it about how he lived, what he taught? Right. That we're still talking about him like centuries later. That's what's so interesting to me. And that's what we're hoping to figure out, I guess. Yeah. And to really wrap our heads around Socrates, we kind of have to like mentally transport ourselves back to Athens in the fifth century BC. Mm -hmm. But it's not all, you know, like philosophers just chilling out, debating the meaning of life. Oh, absolutely not. It was um... like, what was it really like back then? It was a really bustling city-state. I mean, it was a democracy. Okay. But there was always tension and all these threats from outside. I mean, don't forget, this is like right in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. Oh, right, yeah. When Athens and Sparta are like really going at it, you know, for control. Ah, Sparta. <laughs> Those rivals, like their whole military culture, the discipline was, it's like people were kind of drawn to it, even in Athens, which is so weird. It's like being obsessed with your biggest rival. It's true. And it actually shows how complicated Athenian society was back then. Like even within their democracy, this fascination with Sparta. Especially among like the elite. Yeah, the elite especially. It really highlights this underlying fragility of Athenian democracy. Like it wasn't this, you know, perfect system. It was constantly being questioned and debated and reshaped. And religion was a huge deal back then, right? Yeah. It wasn't just like, oh, we're devout people. It was like their whole social and political world revolved around it. Oh, 100%. The gods were a part of everything in ancient Greece. Politics, law, everyday life, you name it. Like, if you insulted the gods, that could have some serious consequences, politically speaking. And that's the world that Socrates is born into. Okay, so we've got this really vibrant, intense Athens trying to figure itself out. And then along comes Socrates. And I'll be honest, before all of this, when I pictured Socrates, it was literally just like that marble bust. Yeah. You know? Yeah, we all have that image, right? The classic wise philosopher look. Totally. But it's easy to forget that he was a real person with, you know, all his quirks, his contradictions, his personality. Even back then, he was someone who broke the mold. Totally. And talk yeah. about breaking the mold. The sources we have describe him as, well, let's just say not your typical Greek ideal of beauty. Like they mentioned a snub nose, bulging eyes. He really didn't fit into any neat boxes and looks or in life, really. I mean, he was a hoplite, a hoplite. That's like a heavily armed infantryman in the Athenian army. So he definitely wasn't afraid of a fight. And he was committed to Athens, clearly. But then he lived this super simple life, almost no possessions, didn't care about material things or comfort. He even had this really unconventional family life, which doesn't really fit the image of a, you know, calm and detached philosopher. Definitely not. His personal life definitely raised some eyebrows and just added to the mystery surrounding him. But maybe the most interesting thing about Socrates, the thing that really comes through in everything he did and said, was this concept of ironia. Ironia. That's more than just our modern day irony, right? Way more nuanced. Like, picture this deliberate ambiguity, you know? This playful way of masking his true intentions. It's almost like he was always playing devil's advocate, but you could never really tell if he was serious or if he was trying to, like, guide you to some deeper truth. So he basically kept everyone guessing. And this ironia, this deliberate ambiguity was like key to his whole approach to philosophy, right? The Socratic method. Yeah. But here's where things get tricky. Yeah. He never actually wrote anything down. He didn't, no. Everything we know about him comes. Like what other people wrote, mainly his students, people like Plato. Which is what makes this all so challenging, but also really exciting. It's like we're trying to understand this incredibly important figure, but all we have are these secondhand accounts. Right. Each one filtered through the author's own interpretations and, you know, maybe their biases is like trying to put together a puzzle, but some of the pieces are missing. And others are probably from a completely different puzzle. Exactly. So how do we even begin to unpack his beliefs? Like what did Socrates actually believe? What were the core ideas in his philosophy? That's the million dollar question, right? But even with all those challenges, there are some common threads we find in the accounts of Plato, Xenophon, you know, another student of his, even Aristotle, who wrote about him years later. And it's really interesting because despite their differences, 
they all paint this consistent picture of Socrates as someone deeply concerned with ethics and virtue. Hmm. So ethics and virtue. But that's kind of vague, right? Like yeah. he wasn't just trying to be, you know, a good person. What was he really getting at? You got it. Yeah. Socrates wasn't some abstract philosopher, you know, stuck in his own head. He cared about the real world. Like, how do you actually live a good life? Hmm. Okay, so how did he go about answering those questions? Well, he was famous for this thing, the Socratic method. Oh, right. I've heard of that. But to really get it, you got to picture him in the Athenian Agora. That was like their marketplace right in the heart of the city. Okay. And he'd be there talking to everyday people from all walks of life. He didn't lecture or anything. He'd ask these really pointed questions. Oh, so he was trying to expose the flaws in their thinking, make them question what they believed. Exactly. Socrates saw himself as this gadfly, like he was waking people up from this intellectual slumber. He really believed that true knowledge, it doesn't come from just accepting whatever you're told. It comes from questioning everything, testing your beliefs, even dismantling them if you have to. And this is where it gets interesting to me. He really thought that if you truly understood what was good, you would naturally do good, right? Yeah, that was his big idea. For Socrates, there was no separation between knowledge and action, between like knowing what's right and then actually doing it. He said that people do bad things, not because they're evil, but because they don't actually understand what's good. I see. So ignorance is the problem, not some kind of inherent badness. Exactly. If someone acts unjustly, it's because they don't truly get what justice is. At least that's what Socrates believed. It makes you think, though, there are definitely people out there who know something's wrong, but they still do it anyway. Right. And that's where Socrates' own life, especially his trial and death, really makes you think, here's this guy who spent his life searching for truth, for virtue. He really believed that knowledge was the key to a better life. Right. And still, his own city condemned him. Yeah, his trial. That's a whole other chapter in his story. It wasn't just about Socrates, though. It says a lot about the world he was living in, too. 100%. It wasn't just some personal tragedy. This was a clash of values. Like, what happens when an individual searching for truth bumps up against the rules of society, especially a society that's feeling a little insecure. So set the stage for us. It's 399 BC. Athens has just gone through this long war. They're still recovering. Why was Socrates public enemy number one at this exact moment? You have to remember what it was like in Athens back then. The war had really shaken things up. They were afraid of anything that might threaten their stability, even ideas. And Socrates, always questioning authority, hanging out with some shady characters, not exactly a good look. Right, and he was close to some controversial figures like Aldebiades, this brilliant but kind of reckless general who actually switched sides during the war and fought for Sparta. Yeah. And then there was Crataeus, who became one of the 30 tyrants, this really oppressive group that ruled Athens for a bit after the war. Yikes. Not the best people to be associated with, let's yeah. just say. Okay, so the official charges were impiety, like disrespecting the gods and corrupting the youth. But it sounds like there was more to it than that. Way more to it. Like, right. yeah, on the surface, they said he wasn't honoring the Athenian gods and that he was leading young people astray with his radical ideas. But there's something else going on, I think. I think so too. It was like this ironia we were talking about, remember? All that questioning, never taking anything at face value. I think that finally caught up with him. It's like they were threatened by his ideas <laughs> just as much as anything he actually did. For sure. His accusers thought he was dangerous. He was a threat to traditional values, to their authority. And remember how we talked about that Athenian fascination with Sparta? Well, some of the things Socrates was teaching, they could be seen as, I don't know, kind of pro-Sparta. And that would not have gone over well in Athens. Definitely not. So you can see why they might have seen him as a threat. He was challenging everything they thought they knew. So he's on trial, facing these super serious charges. And I have to say, reading about his defense, it doesn't sound like he exactly helped himself out. It's true, yeah. Like, the way Plato describes it, Socrates' defense was pretty remarkable, okay. but not in the way you'd expect. He didn't try to, like, make excuses or back down from what he believed. Really? But actually, it was the opposite. He used his time in court to, like, double down on his ideas, you know? Yeah. He questioned the jury, just like he questioned everyone else, making them really think about, like, what is piety? What's virtue? What does it actually mean to be a good citizen? It's like he'd rather die for what he believed in than have to compromise. It's a powerful statement for sure. And his followers, especially Plato, they never forgot it. Plato's writings about the trial, they really made Socrates a legend. 
In a way, his death proved just how powerful ideas can be, you know, and how important it is to stand up for what you believe in, no matter what. It's incredible. Yes. Socrates is definitely one of the most influential thinkers in Western history. But like, what is it about him, his story, his ideas that still resonates with us? even today. That's the amazing thing about Socrates' legacy. It's not like he wrote down a specific philosophy or a set of rules to live by. He left us something way more valuable. What's that? A method, a way of thinking, the Socratic method. It's all about critical thinking, examining your own beliefs, never just accepting things without questioning. It's just as relevant now as it was back in ancient Athens. This is more about the questions he asked than like any specific answers. Absolutely. Socrates forces us to think for ourselves. Don't just take things at face value. Dig deeper. Figure things out for yourself. And in today's world, with so much information out there, it's easy to just go along with whatever everyone else is saying, right? Right. But Socrates reminds us how important it is to think critically, to be able to have real discussions, to be open to different points of view. It makes you wonder, though, can you misuse the Socratic method? Like, are there people who use questioning to manipulate others, you know? or to push their own agenda. That's a really good point. Like anything else, it depends on how you use it. Socrates knew that. He always said how important it is to be humble, to really examine yourself, to be honest about what you're looking for. I guess it's like that saying, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. Yeah, exactly. It's not enough to just be smart. You have to be responsible with that knowledge too. So, as we wrap up our deep dive on Socrates, I'm thinking about this guy living thousands of years ago and how he still has so much to teach us today. He really does. He challenged the status quo back then, and he's still challenging us now to question everything, to never stop learning, to be brave enough to stand up for what we believe in. What a legacy, right? So next time you're facing a tough question or a complicated issue where you're just trying to understand something better, remember Socrates. Channel your inner gadfly and ask those tough questions. See where the answers take you. Until next time, keep your minds open, keep exploring, and we'll catch you on our next In this grind called life, we hold our heads high. Through the stormy skies, we never say die. Facing every challenge like a stoic knight. With every step forward, we ignite the night. Bounce back from the falls, never showing no fear. In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear. With a heart of iron and a steady aim, we charge through the pain, never see Seeking fame. Keep it moving, keep it strong. Push it forward all day long. So we courage battle on. Raise your voice and sing this song. From the valleys low to the highest peaks, we conquer the silence even when it speaks. Life's battles rage on, we never shy away. Standing firm in the fray each and every day. Of resilience pounding in our chest Fighting every battle, never taking rest Stoic courage flowing in our veins Through the joy and through the pains Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Back from the falls, never showing no fear In the darkest moments, our minds stay clear With a heart of iron and a steady aim We charge through the pain, never seeking fame Keep it moving, keep it strong Push it forward all day long Stoic courage battle on Raise your voice and sing this song Keep it moving, keep it strong A man or woman must be dedicated to stability, immovable, unwavering, no doubt, no fear. Your destiny is predicated on your ability to remain calm, cool, and collected. It is not a matter of not allowing men or women to press your buttons. The truth is, there must be no buttons to press. If you allow anger 
to control you, to govern you, to arrest you, you're bankrupt. Get back in the driver's seat. Gain control over your emotions. Be committed. Be fully persuaded to peace, for without which you will never fulfill your purpose. With everything that you think, and every word that you speak, and every move that you make, let peace and harmony be your portion. The warrior that is angry is at war with himself. Do not under any circumstances depend on a partial feeling. Think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. Never let yourself be saddened by a separation. Resentment and complaint are appropriate neither for oneself nor others. Do not let yourself be guided by the feelings of lust or love. In all things, except whatever comes to you woven in the pattern of your destiny, for what could more aptly fit your needs? If you are not willing to risk the usual, you will have to settle for the ordinary. Happiness is the activity of the soul in accordance with excellence. Aristotle This quote defines happiness as a state of flourishing achieved through the pursuit of virtue and the development of one's full potential. Happiness is wanting what you get. When anger rises, think of the consequences. A lot of people have gone further than they thought they could because someone else thought they could. Zig Ziglar When you, when you have something you want to do, if you don't develop the courage to do that which has been given you to do, and you spend a lot of time going around trying to convince other people or trying to get their approval, what will happen is that you will lose your nerve and other people will convince you that what you're doing doesn't have any value and you'll give up on your dream. It's an interesting thing about life I've also found that if you don't have the courage to act, Sometimes, and particularly, if you have something special to do, life will move on you. I'd, if, 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 if it were not for life, I would still be a disc jockey. I didn't just leave voluntarily to go to the state legislature. I was fired. I was working on a job. And I came home one day, I was married at the time, and I told my former wife, I said, that guy Bert I work for is stupid. She said, if he's so stupid, why does he sign you a paycheck? <laughs> now you see why I divorced her, right? <laughs> I couldn't stand her. <laughs> that night, I could not sleep well. Here was a guy that was controlling my life. I was going through all kinds of changes because this man controlled my paycheck. And it was Carlisle who said, truth crushed to earth shall rise again. Winston Churchill said, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but at the end, there it is. And we know scripture that says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And the truth that I had to come to grips with that I wasn't in charge of my destiny. The truth was that... I was and since pleasure is our first and native good, for that reason we do not choose every pleasure whatsoever, but will often pass over many pleasures when a greater annoyance ensues from them. And often we consider pain superior to pleasures when submission to the pains for a long time brings us as a consequence a greater pleasure.
While therefore all pleasure, because it is naturally akin to us, is good, not all pleasure is should be chosen, just as all pain is an evil, and yet not all pain is to be shunned. It is, however, by measuring one against another, and by looking at the conveniences and inconveniences, that all these matters must be judged. Sometimes we treat the good as an evil, and the evil, on the contrary, as a good. Never put off till tomorrow the fun you can have today. Smiling doesn't necessarily mean you're happy. Sometimes it just means you're strong. Water can carry a boat, it can also sink it. Chinese proverb. As is a tale, so is life. Not how long it is, but how good it is, is what matters. Never make a permanent decision based on temporary emotions. The difference between those who succeed and those who fail is not the presence of fear, but how they respond to it. Alex Hormozzi You move from the mundane, from the average, to mastery. Mastery is an obsession. Those who are obsessed with the process of becoming are the ones who become. See, a lot of people, they want that gold, they want that ring, but they don't want to put that work in. And in order to achieve, I must understand that I must study. I must study to move from average to mastery. It's the daily battle. It's the daily grind that prepares us and equips us to win the war. Why do you do what you do? Why do you want what you want? The question is why have you delved deeply into the reason why you do what you do? I need you to take a moment and garner up all the belief that you have left in yourself and in the idea of what is possible to make this thing happen. The process is muddy. The process is murky. The process is dark. The process is cold. The process is going to leave you in places where you're going to feel like you have been abandoned, like nobody believes in you, nobody supports you. What is your why? Because if your why is powerful enough, then you can persevere through the process. What is it? Find it. When you don't see a light at the end of your tunnel, you got to remember the light that is burning inside of you that nobody is able to put out. There is not a person on this planet that can stop you. It is a possibility that you are only doing what you are doing because somebody told you to do it. It is in thy power absolutely to exclude all manner of conceit and opinion as concerning this matter, and by the same means to exclude all grief and sorrow from thy soul. For as for the things and objects themselves, they of themselves have no such power whereby to beget and force upon us any opinion at all. He who is satisfied with his lot is rich. When you try to please everybody, you almost always please nobody. Good habits formed at youth make all the difference. Aristotle. 